Well, hello friends, welcome to week two of Reunion, Learning, Living, and Giving the Good News of Jesus. We have said in this series that we want to challenge ourselves as a church to wake up to the fullness of the gospel, and part of the way we're gonna do that is by challenging ourselves to actually live like it's true, to actually embody the message in our lives, and that includes, if it's really true, wanting to tell other people about it, that we don't wanna just keep the message to ourselves. So this week, week two, God with us, we are talking about the ground of the gospel, the foundation upon which the rest of the gospel is predicated upon, that God is actually with us, for us, that he cares about us, that he's on our side, he's for us, and not against us, God with us. Now we said we're gonna give ourselves a few different tools to help us get the gospel into us in different ways. You've got your sermon notes across all of our sites. Make sure you're tracking along with those. And you can see at the beginning, we've got our scripture text and we've got a a suggested scripture memory verse, one or two verses each week for the keeners who wanna dig a little deeper, suggesting you grab a couple of theme verses and just meditate on them every day and let them sink in. I wouldn't necessarily approach it as I just have to memorize, but I wanna meditate on and then just see it get into our bones. When we study, it's like typing out the message into our hearts, but when we meditate, it's like pushing enter and it it gets into us. And so I hope that you'll avail yourself of that. And we're also tracking with the book Reunion and each week in the message is going to be supplemented by, we're not just gonna repeat the content of the text, but gonna be supplemented by that week's chapter. And I'm hoping that we have different ways of getting the message really inside us. And that includes the blog, the Bruxy blog is being diverted for this series. So instead of doing a drive home or an after party podcast for this series, I'm gonna be blogging about some supplemental thoughts each week, so make sure you sign up for the email update so you know when a new one is posted, and that'll also give you kind of a midweek boost to reflect back on some of the stuff we're talking about. And lastly, we said we want to connect with a study buddy for the series. How you doing on that? Rats, I did remember. You were hoping I forget, but uh, we'll talk more about that before we're done. All right. Maybe some of you feel like me, as we said last week, quick review, we're very motivated by that wonderful quote from St. Francis of Assisi that says, preach the gospel at all times, when necessary, use words. And we said last week there's just two problems with this. Number one, St. Francis of Assisi never said it. Secondly, it's just not true. (laughs) That's another problem. That the gospel is actually, it means good news, and good news has content that has to be communicated. So when you preach the gospel through words. Now, we said it's important that it be supplemented by and supported by a good life. Good news should translate into a good life. So it's important that we live out the gospel, but we're not communicating the gospel just by living a good life. Look, we all have friends who are happy and who are joyful and who are helpful and who have an appropriate chill factor and they're just great to be around. And we don't know why that's the case. For some of them, it's because they're on drugs. You know, they're, they're high all the time. All right, that's great, and they're fun to be around. And so just living a good life and having the fruit of the Spirit is not the gospel. You wanna have a good life that paves the way for a conversation that actually presents the gospel, but the gospel has content. It's good news. And so we need to learn how to talk about the reason for why we live the way we live. And we said three reasons that the Apostle Paul gives, three motivating factors in Romans chapter one are in verse five, he talks about wanting to preach the gospel just because he, he wants to do this for the namesake of Christ. He wants to give honor to Jesus. One of the ways we honor those we love is how we talk about them to others. Uh, and we said that if, if Jesus really is the centerpiece of your life, anything that is that important in your life would just naturally come up in conversation. It would be odd if it didn't. So if you say, well, I'm just one of those people who likes to live the message instead of always talk about the message, that may be some excuse making. If you don't ever talk about Jesus and he is a central theme of your life, it would be actually a case of you subconsciously, systematically avoiding a topic rather than just not always bringing it up. You're probably having to expend a lot of psychological energy to make sure you avoid talking about Jesus if he really is that central to your life. So we wanna honor him. Uh, Paul also said he feels obligated, that is, it's a moral obligation if you have a message that can help someone else and change their life, but we withhold it. But then he says he wants to go beyond obligation to being eager, eager to proclaim the gospel, he says, because it's the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes, that it's got power to change lives. And it doesn't matter if, 
if 100 people say I'm not interested or no thank you or give you grief or argue, it's that 101st person, that's why we're doing this, is so that as somewhere along the way when you do see a transformed life, it makes all the conversations worthwhile. And so Paul, Paul knows what it was like to be rejected and to have many, many, many people say no, thank you. And uh, so certainly, those transformed lives he did see made him eager to keep going and have the conversations. It was worthwhile. And that kind of pushback, people just saying, no, I'm not interested, or even just mocking or making fun of, has been a part of the Christian experience since the beginning. Do you know the earliest depiction we have in art form of Jesus? The earliest depiction that we have of Christ is graffiti that is designed to ridicule comes from about the year 200. In Rome, in the barracks of the, uh, the page boys who would have served in the emperor's court, they could have been younger kids, they could have been teenagers, they could have been young adults. But in their barracks, someone made sure that they mocked a fellow page boy who had become a Christian by drawing a depiction of Jesus. We have it here in its original form, and just for clarity's sake, we can see that Jesus is pictured on the cross with the head of a donkey. And this is a young man whose name is Alexamenos. And someone has painted or, or carved into the stone the picture of Alexamenos worshiping Jesus and the inscription reads, Alexamenos worships his God. Designed to mock and to ridicule. I think of what kind of pain, what kind of sense of loneliness, what kind of sense of pushing against the grain did Alexamenos experience. What he will never know is that, that his, his courage to live for Jesus in the midst of a pagan Roman culture is encouraging Christians 2,000 years later. That, that we see in him an example of someone who doesn't go undercover, go underground, but who continues to worship Christ even though he is mocked. I mean, Rome itself are the ones who crucified the one you say you worship as a god? How weak and insipid is that? The misunderstandings are just flowing. You know, what's interesting is that uh, archeologists uncovered in the next room on a different wall, a second inscription carved into the wall with a different hand, just reading, Alexamenos is faithful. I don't know if that was Alexamenos himself or it was someone else who was observing him, but just kind of his way of saying, no, no, I, I'm faithful no matter what, even if I have to put up with that. It's amazing. Uh, he's inspiring to me as, that as a young person, we can take a stand. Um, it's interesting, because Nina and I were talking about that this week, and she said, you know, it almost makes me just want to have another baby so we can name him Alexamenos. <laughs> I thought, yeah, he's not that inspiring. No, <laughs> but anyway, it's just amazing. Now, it is true that in the West, we have been influenced then, thinking about the content of the gospel that we're gonna communicate. We have been influenced by a certain way of framing the gospel that has served us well in many ways, but I think has been very truncated and incomplete. It really goes back to a revolution in how the gospel was shared in the 1950s, and we haven't we haven't really rethought it since then. In the 1950s, a gentleman named Bill Bright wrote the four spiritual laws for an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ. And these four laws were designed to help people understand the basics of the gospel and communicate the basics of the gospel. Uh, law number one, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That phrase has become iconic within evangelical Christianity. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Law two, our sin has separated us from God. Law three, Jesus is God's only provision for our salvation. Law four, we must receive salvation by faith in Christ. And these basic four points are something that we have uh, locked onto. And in fact, over the decades, as different Christian organizations have sought to reframe the gospel in different ways, to sharpen it and make it more easily communicable and understood, we've never diverted from these same basic four points. There has been the bridge to life by the Navigators and uh, Steps to Peace with God by the Billy Graham Association and the Roman Road and the Reformed Roman Road and uh, all of these are predicated on the same four points. We, we tweaked it, but we never expanded it. And my challenge to this way of thinking is that, well, I believe it's all true, and I'm grateful for these tools for sharing the gospel. 
is that it's incomplete, that Jesus taught a gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom that was at hand, the kingdom that is happening here and now, where with Christ as king, that the kingdom of God gives us a whole new way of living here and now. It's not just about salvation from sin, from sin so we can go to heaven when we die. It is praying thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that he calls us then to be ambassadors for this kingdom here and now, carrying this message. It gives us a whole new purpose in how we live. And, and beyond that, Jesus also said that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He saw his own death as the inauguration of the new kingdom and the new covenant. That a covenant being a whole new way of relating to God. It was the end of the old, the end of the religious system of his day and any day. And a, and a calling into direct intimacy with God. And that irreligious aspect of the gospel is also something that has been underrepresented. And so I'm hoping that we can be a generation of believers who, who kind of push the reset button on this and say thank you for this tool in the past but it's not expansive enough. The gospel is very much more this worldly in how it impacts our lives. It doesn't just try and rescue us out of this world. And so I've tried to do my part in helping us expand our understanding of the gospel through what I call the gospel in 30 words. And the gospel in 30 words should not be new to you if you've been around the meeting house for any length of time. Here's how I would frame it. Jesus is God with us. That's what we'll be looking at today. Come to show us God's love, save us from sin, set up God's kingdom, and shut down religion. I kept four points just as evangelical comfort food. To show us God's love, save us from sin, set up God's kingdom, and shut down religion so we can share in God's life. Now, this intro, Jesus is God with us, that's the ground of the gospel. It, everything that comes after is, is foundational, is, is based upon this foundation. That God is for us, not against us. And then that opens up our hearts to hear what he has to say. Uh, the, the four things that Jesus does for us are the four gifts of the gospel. So you have the ground of the gospel and you have four gifts of the gospel, things that Christ has accomplished on our behalf. And then lastly is the goal of the gospel, the direction, where it is all headed to, us being welcomed into the love life of God. So first of all, the ground of the gospel, that's what we're talking about today. And this is good news not just for non-Christians, but for Christians too. Remember last week that the Apostle Paul said, I wanna preach this gospel to you, the church in Rome. That, that many of us as Christians, we have had a hard time believing that God's really with us, I mean really for us, not against us. We've turned the gospel into a necessary thing we have to do to get a, a really upset God to be happy with us so we can be with him. And we we as Christians often need to hear the gospel again and again as well. In Matthew 1, we read this about the birth of Christ. After the angel prophesies that he will be named Jesus because he will save, he will save his people from their sins and says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel with the I is Hebrew, with an E is Greek, both are correct spelling. God with us is what it means. In other words, not just that God is coming to us, we often think of that because it's embedded within the Christmas story, we think of the incarnation. God with us means that God came down in human form, which is true, but it's saying more than that. The primary context of the prophecy, which comes from Isaiah that he's referring to here, is when a king was afraid that his enemy was gonna win the battle and that God was on his enemy's side and was gonna use the enemy to punish him and he was tempted to make an unholy alliance with a pagan nation to help support Israel or Judah so they wouldn't lose the battle. And Isaiah is sent as a prophet to come to him and say no, God is with you. It doesn't just mean God's present, because if he's present but as your judge, it's not good news. But that God is with you as in he's not against you. He's on your side, not on your enemy's side. He's here to keep you safe and secure from the harm that they're going to do. You don't need to be reaching out to other alliances in order to be safe. God is really with you. This is the primary context we want to communicate with the concept of Emmanuel, God with us. It's interesting, a few years ago, I don't know if you um, remember the news about the atheist bus campaign in England. It was primarily in London, but also some other places, and different versions of it came to America, Canada, and a few other countries around the world. Atheists funded a bus campaign with this slogan. Here it is. It was on the side of buses and uh, public transportation around London, England. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. 
There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. There was some debate among atheists, should it say probably or definitely or most likely or most probably, but they settled on this, there's probably no God. I'm most interested in the follow-up line, the secondary line. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life is predicated on the belief that if there is a God, that is something that we should be worrying about. In other words, if there is a God, we're screwed. Because, as we all know from religion, he's judgmental, he is mean-spirited, he is violent, and he loves to throw people into hell, and you're likely one of them. You're worm meat, you are, and, and the, the idea of God being so against us rather than for us has been, and we're partially to blame, aren't we, has been so propagated by religious people, including Christians, that it's preferable, that an antidote for dealing with the anxiety of death is actually atheism. It's to say, well, I can live in a much better universe than that, thank you very much. It's a universe where God just doesn't exist. But of course, all of that is predicated on a God that is against you rather than for you. And we need to repent of of any image of that God that we have given, for God is for us, not against us. We find this talked about not only by Jesus, but also then the writers of the New Testament, and we're gonna look at a place where that's kinda drilled into us in Hebrews, chapter one and chapter two. So open up your Bibles with me to Hebrews one and two. The book of Hebrews, middle of the New Testament, and across all our sites, if you don't have a Bible with you, we have visitor Bibles at our sites, and you can either get up and pick up, pick up one now, or at some of our sites, ushers are handing them out to you. Make sure you flag them down, and open up with me to Hebrews. Chapter one is where we'll start. You know, Jesus had already said this in John 14. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Here's how you will know God, get to know me. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You've really seen God. If you see Jesus, you're seeing God. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You're getting to know his character. So when we look at Jesus, what do we see? We see someone who doesn't come to judge. He says in John 3, 16 and 17, that uh, he has come not to judge the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Um, and he, he is someone who comes full of forgiveness and embrace. He challenges the religious institutions of his day, religious hypocrisy, but he embraces sinners and invites, he parties with them and invites them into his world as he joins them in their world. He shows us that God is really for us, not against us. In Hebrews 1, verse three, let's just read the first part of verse three and then I wanna point out something in chapter two. Hebrews 1, verse three, it says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. The radiance of God's glory, you see that? Radiance, the shininess of God's glory. So the fullness of God's glory. When God's glory shines, it doesn't shine as fear me and worship me, or I am the judge and you are condemned, or I am powerful creator. Yes, it's all true, but it shines like Jesus. It looks like Jesus. The shininess of God's glory looks like Jesus, born in a manger, humbly loving, washing feet, laying his life down, even for his enemies. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. And he is the exact representation of his being the exact representation of his being. Exact representation, the Greek word for exact representation is character. Character from which we get the word character. Surprise. An imprint, an engraving, a reproduction. When something is stamped into or carved into something, you would have a character, an exact representation of the thing. So for instance, in money, uh, in Canada, our our loony has a loon and has the queen, and our toony has, in most cases, a polar bear and the queen. Uh, this is a character, an exact representation, a stamping into. So when God wants to take his, his essence, his reality, which, his nature, which is the word uh, hypostasis. Hypostasis, it says, uh, his essence or his, his substance, his reality. When he wants to take his actual essence and stamp it into humanity, uh, that's Jesus, the fullness of who God is stamped into humanity. 
When we stare at Jesus, we get the clearest picture of what God is like. And he's for us, he's not against us. And now he fleshes that out a bit in chapter two. Look at chapter two, verse 14. Chapter two, verse 14. Now since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. We have flesh and blood, so the word became flesh because he's coming to redeem us, he becomes one of us. His, his, the essence of God, the hypostasis, is stamped into our flesh and blood so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held slavery by their fear of death. By becoming one of us, dying and rising again, and then pointing the way that there is a good God waiting on the other side of death, who loves us this much, loves us to death and back again, wants to forgive us and reconcile with us and have us join him in his love life. By pointing to that God, he removes, he not even defeats the dark powers that stand against us, he removes our fear of death, which is interesting because from a psychological point of view, it is true that people almost universally struggle with some form of the fear of death. This fear of what's on the other side. Uh, and, and religion has a kind of job security for many people <clears throat> because it, it preys upon our fear. And, and it doesn't fully remove the fear because of job security, it keeps the fear present and just always gives you enough to make it another day. A lot of religion is predicated on the fear of death. In fact, some of the most fearful people on the planet are very religious people. Afraid of dark forces coming against them, a fear of death, fear of judgment, fear of fear, fear, fear. And so they have to keep coming back to get topped up with grace or doing whatever they have to do according to the religious system to make sure they're on God's good side, to make sure that they're getting the protection they need, to make sure that the dark spirits are kept away, to make sure that they don't live in the joy and the grace that Jesus offers. Even within the Christian religion, this is often the case, which is why many Christians also need the gospel. He's come to do away with our fear of death. You know, and many of us in the West, it's not religion that, that we use to help conquer our fear of death. You know what it is, it's just denial and distraction. We have the resources to continually distract ourselves uh, through arts and entertainment and sports and video games and movies and Netflix. We can just continually be self-medicating against the fear by Entertainment and distraction, whatever it may be for us, we've got our entertainment of choice, we're just constantly, then we talk about the entertainment we just had, and then we want more, and then we think about it, and then we binge watch this, and we're always tracking with, we've got so much interesting stuff going on that we can just be in denial about our fear. And we have the resources to pull that off fairly well within our society. But, a genuine fear that's always present, if, even if it is latent or repressed, suppressed, subconscious, It is still an energy drain, it's still there. And we need our next hit of distraction so we don't get sucked into the abyss of our own fear. And the beautiful message of Jesus is when you get rid of the distraction, when you put it aside, when you slow down, when you pause long enough to think about the deeper truths of reality, fear is not what you should find but love. A great delight in you that God has, a God who is for you and not against you. And we may be missing out on a great source of peace and joy because we're a little worried of what we might find there. And so this message of God being for us no matter what, getting rid of our fear of death becomes instrumental in opening up our hearts to have the courage even to listen to the rest of the gospel. He says in verse 17, or verse 16, for surely it's not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. The word for helps there is actually grab hold of. I think help is a bit of an understated translation. He's not trying to help angels, he's trying to help humans, and we're flesh and blood, so he stamped himself into humanity, into flesh and blood, and this word for help is actually the word for to grab a hold of and pull. Uh, Like someone who's fallen down and you help, fallen into a, a pit and you help, but the the Greek just has more force. He has then come into our humanity so he can just grab hold of our humanity and pull us towards himself as Abraham's descendants. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, for this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest that is representing us now as a human in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. The word here for atonement means to to wipe clean, to pardon, to forgive. He's taking care of that, he's doing it all himself. 
because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He empathizes with us. He's fully with us, he gets us. When we pray to him now, we pray to a God who who says, "I, I get you. In chapter four, it's gonna repeat the same idea. He gets you in every way, including every way that you're tempted. It just adds, he didn't sin through that temptation, but he understands even the force of temptation. He fully became our flesh and he understands our weakness. There's a song that we sometimes sing at the meeting house here in Oakville, we sang it this morning, it has the lyrics, I'm no longer a slave to fear, right? I am a child of God. That's the message of God with us. I've been delivered from my fear. God is for me, not against me. Abraham Maslow in the 50s and 60s became popular for his hierarchy of needs. If you took intro to psych in university, you studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs beyond our physiological needs. And and the idea is that we can't reach our higher needs, human needs, until we get our basic ones met first. Uh, Beyond our physiological needs that we need to eat, you know, sleep, our safety or security needs that we need to feel safe. If if we are constantly afraid that a, a wild animal is gonna attack us or that we're not gonna, that we're not going to have uh, protection from bad guys, or if, if we are, whether real or not, if we are struggling with fear of a lack of security or safety, we will not be able to progress to learning what it means to belong and to have a sense of esteem, et cetera. And spiritually speaking, this is also true. That we can't move on to the higher aspects of the gospel if we're just afraid that God's trying to judge us and we're just really trying to learn this so that we can get on his good side so that the God who is basically a harsh, 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 anti-me, God, I can finally get past that as long as I say yes to Jesus and do the right things. But rather, when I know that he's for me, not against me, my sense of security is, is settled. And I'm ready, as I said earlier, to open up to hear more. So I think that first line of the gospel, Jesus is God with us, is what addresses our fundamental need for safety and security that I'm now having the conversation with and about the God who is for me, not against me. He pursues us. I wanna throw it open to Q&A, but uh, before I do, one last thing. I don't know if when you were younger if you remember the bridge to life diagram. People on one side, God on the other, sin separating us. It looks something like this. I'd always say sin down here when I was a kid, and it always said man, not human, not person, just man. I remember thinking, what about women? I guess they don't need God, doesn't matter, I'm not one of them, so I'll move on. (laughs) I was a kid, basically selfish. I just wanted to get to heaven when I died. This was presented to me. And of course, this chasm of sin could be bridged only by Jesus. Of course, it it, it became still a bit of a problem to me because I thought, how am I supposed to climb over that? I'm not that athletic. Even as a kid, I thought, I don't know if that's a bigger help or not. Maybe I could jump, but I can't climb. I don't know. Uh, So (laughs) other than that, we would also add an arrow across the top heading in that direction. We would say, Jesus becomes the bridge that gets us to God. You know, and basically, I think the diagram is helpful. But I would change a couple things. First of all, I'd shave down the top of the cross (laughs) to give, you know, fat kids hope. And then the other thing I would do (laughs) is say, I, I would change the direction of the arrow. This is really, Jesus is really about God pursuing us, coming to us. It's not just a way of getting us to heaven, it's God coming to us and saying, I, I value you, I'm on your side, I wanna pursue you. This is the message of the gospel. All right, let's hold open to Q&A. Something I've said or left unsaid, something in the text. All right, there's a hand here. John's coming with a mic. Was there a text question while, we have, while we're going for this one? Okay, anonymous, so I'll get to yours in a second. Anonymous says, is there a way for good news to be communicated without words? I, I no. <laughs> good news can be reinforced by our life. Our life can lead to questions that will then lead to a proclamation of the gospel. But see, I think just living a good life is there, it depends on what the reason is. Someone might be filled with the fruit of the Spirit all the time and just really, and you know why? It's because they do drugs. <laughs> right? 
So it's not just, you're happy all the time, thanks man. And you're just, I'm just really, you know, you're so gracious and generous, you wanna share everything, it's hard to make you mad, you're so just mellow and calm, real fruit of the spirit. Yeah, it could be that they never got off their painkillers, we don't know what it is. So yes, how you live is an important aspect of reinforcing the message. But there is a message, a message that needs to be communicated. Great question, okay, yes. Morning, Brexy. Um, so last week I had a conversation with one of my friends who's agnostic, mm, cool. and we actually were talking for over an hour, and it was quite interesting. She seemed to be open to the idea of listening, mm. um, but we kind of came to an impasse where she was saying everyone has their own crutch, mm. and I don't judge. Mm. So how would you proceed if someone said that to you? Oh, uh, that's great. I'd say, tell me about your crutch. What's your crutch? And I won't judge either. Fair, this is gonna be a great conversation. I wanna learn about your crutch. And then, uh, in conversations that are question-based, and I encourage us to ask more questions, make less assertions up front in a conversation, the polarity should be shifted. You will have some things you wanna communicate eventually, but at first you wanna ask more than you say. Um, a great quote called someone I've interviewed before and talked about here says, uh, never make a statement if it can be phrased in the form of a question. If it's possible to ask instead of say, go for the ask first. So I'd wanna ask, tell me more about your crutch. And it's, it is then the second and third level follow-up questions that become interesting. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll ask a question. So tell me about your crutch. Well, I don't know, I like Buddhism, I meditate a bit, and I also believe a, a little bit of, you know, I have a Catholic background, I weave a bit of that in. And we'll go, oh, okay. Well, anyway, what I wanna say is, it's the second and third level follow-up questions that get interesting. So a Buddha, oh, okay, tell me what it is about the Buddha that draws you in. Or, or how do you weave Jesus? You mentioned your Catholic background. How do you weave Jesus into that? I want to, they're gonna answer that and they're gonna say, well, the Buddha really about peace, et cetera. Uh, my Catholic background, I think Jesus was cool because he, the next level of follow-up questions gets even more interesting. Okay, so if you think Jesus is really, how do you connect Jesus and Buddha on this point where it seems like they disagree? Is that, is that an issue for you or? Or how do you think that, and, and as you continue to ask the follow-up questions, the conversation gets really interesting. And you learn more about your friend, but they also learn when they get a chance to hear themselves. Because a lot of people believe stuff just almost instinctively. And it's part of just reaching for whatever just makes them feel better. And by asking questions, it gives them a chance to actually figure out what they believe. And sometimes that's what raises for them the question of, my own belief system doesn't make sense. <laughs> I think I am just reaching, and I think maybe I need to also ask some questions and listen to what you're saying. So I'd say get excessively curious and go for those second and third level follow-up questions. Really drill in. We have, okay, we've got someone over here. Uh, good, and then we'll see if someone's sending a text question. First of all, yeah. So back when you were saying about um, the, the bus with the advertisement, do you think maybe when it was saying stop worrying, do you think maybe they were talking about stop worrying on whether or not there is a God, rather than saying stop worrying because if there is a God, he will judge you. Like, do you think that's why they were saying don't worry? Yeah, that's a, it's a great thought, except it still begs the question, why worry whether or not there's a God? It's not an issue of worry. It's just an issue of, I know they don't mean stop worrying that there might not be a God. That's what a religious person might say. An atheist would not say that. There still begs the question that whether or not there's a God should ever be a, part, a point of worry. Should, they're saying it shouldn't be uh, because there's no God. The possibility of a God should never be something to be worried about. Uh, if, if, if God is like Jesus. Jesus is the only one who gives us historically verifiable evidence. Anyway, I appreciate that. And I think you're right that apart from Christ, the fact that there is a God is not encouraging. Jesus is the one who gives us historically verifiable evidence that God is really for us, not against us. Thanks, thank you. Uh, did a text question come in? Mark asks, if God is for us, how does our personal will fit into his plan? Are we still allowed to have our own plans inside of God's will? Yeah, Mark, that's great. Um, yes, yeah, so God has plans for us and cares for us and wants what's best for us, but part of what's best for us is that we learn how to make good and wise decisions on our own. Um, we're gonna get to this later in the series, but self-actualization I think is a very new covenant concept. The fact that as a, as a fully orbed decision-making person who uses my will to make loving and wise choices, I'm no longer just a religious person who follows a rule book 
or follows rules etched in stone and just says, tell me what to do, I'll do it. But I'm actually a person who makes wise and loving choices on my own. So the new covenant says, it's not about just following the rules. I'm gonna put my heart inside you. I'm gonna give you the ability with, in partnership with my spirit to have, be a, live a relational life that's making wise and loving relational decisions. Uh, this is a beautiful, amazing way of living. And so, um, I hope that answers your question because I, I forgot what you asked. <laughs> what was Mark's question? Oh yeah. No, wait, what, yes. <laughs> so then, do, can we make choices? Yes, the whole point is that God wants to help us make good choices, but not make the choices for us. That would defeat the whole purpose. The second spiritual law says that sin separates us from God. How do we reconcile this with Romans 31? Okay, Romans doesn't have 31 chapters, so this is gonna be a hard one to answer. <laughs> Where it says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Ah, uh, that's Romans 8. 31 is close. Uh, Nothing can separate us from the love of God, absolutely, but he is, of course, talking to, he wrote, wrote Romans to Christians. And God, as a Christian now, Jesus has removed the separation, the thing that separates us is sin. He removes it all. Now, the non-Christian is still loved by God. Nothing can separate us in the sense that you can't turn off God's love tap. He just constantly wants to shower you with love, but we can hold up our own umbrella. We can say no, we can keep it away. We can separate ourselves that way. Jesus does remove that. He, and so written, writing to the Christian, I think there's no contradiction. Sin separates us, Jesus removes the separation. And if you're not a Christian, God will keep pursuing you, he just won't force you, he'll keep pursuing you with his love. Great question, okay, over here. Okay, um, I've got a question about that picture of uh, graffiti and Jesus having the head of a donkey. I, I like donkeys, actually, and I really like the, the stories about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and Mary riding on a donkey into Bethlehem and, and also Egypt. So maybe donkeys um, hold a, a much higher place. Maybe donkeys... Uh, symbolize something else like a like a peaceful uh savior is it is it really like is it not possible that that is a compliment rather than a insult oh you're an optimist glass half full kind of person aren't you i appreciate that and you're right about your symbolism of donkeys jesus riding into jerusalem on a donkey instead of on a war horse says i'm a king but i'm going to rule through gentleness and through kindness so i think the symbolism is very real but as is often the case uh, what Romans do to mock Christians in order to mock Christ actually portrays a bigger truth. Uh, for instance, in John 18, we learned that the Romans mocked Jesus, giving him a staff and a crown and a robe, and it was all done to mock, but ironically is making a true statement when they put above his, his what becomes his throne, making the, the cross like a throne. It's, the whole thing is a mockery, but it is actually, in reality, the king ascending to his throne, here is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And so what was done here to mock also is, has some symbolic truth to it, that Jesus leads in gentleness. Having said that, I think it's clear that it's a mock because it's one thing to say I love donkeys, it's another thing if I call you a jackass. Right, that, that's, that becomes an insult. So I don't think that it's, uh, it, it could be interpreted as a compliment to actually say Jesus is a donkey. I think at that point it's, it's just pure mockery. But you're right, the mockery ends up embedding some truth in it. It's a great question, thank you. All right, I haven't forgotten about your homework. Just like, I, I know what it's like when you haven't done it and then you come to class, you just hope the teacher's gonna forget, but I haven't, here we are. Let's talk about it for a moment. The homework last week was to find a study buddy. And, and we, I've put it in your notes again this week. It's not too late to find a study buddy and gives you the same outline that we had last week. Just find someone you can have a five minute conversation with each week to teach them what you learn on Sunday. Not to try and convert them, but for you to get feedback from them to know if you are being clear or not. Are, are you just want feedback. Are you, and you're gonna learn by teaching, learn by teaching. So you wanna find someone who doesn't necessarily believe the same way you do so you can actually practice being clear to someone who doesn't believe and get their feedback.
And I understand that for many of us, it's just hard to even think of going there, but I wanna encourage you to try. And I know that it's gonna be hard. In some cases, you'll try, you'll ask, and some will say no, or they'll just make fun of you, or they just won't have any interest, and that's challenging. So can I tell you my own study buddy story? I, I decided not to do this ahead of time for the series, because I wanted to do it real time with you and go through the same process that you're going through and challenge myself in the same way. So after last week's message, I went and started searching for my study buddy. And I had two people in mind, and I was certain that between the two of them, at least one of them was gonna say yes. Person, plan, plan A person was a probable, and if they said no, then plan B was a shoe in Talk to person A, and said, hey listen, really simple, five minute conversation each week, do you mind if we do this? To which he said, um, no. I said, what do you mean, wait, no, you don't mind? Or did he ask the question that way, it gets confusing. You do mind, what do you mean? What do you, uh, no, like he says, I'm not interested. I said, all right, you might not be really interested. You don't have to come front end loaded with interest in the message. I'm just asking as a friend if you can help me out because you know, we talk and could we? He says, ah, no. I said, yeah, but could we just do that? No. <laughs> wow, okay, plan B. At least plan B will work. Go to plan B. Plan B. I don't call him plan B, by the way. Uh, I say, listen, do you think, you think we could, uh, and I explain the whole thing, it's just a five minute conversation this week and I'm just gonna, he goes, yeah, yeah. Pardon? <laughs> he says, I, just, I don't, really, I don't wanna, I said, no, I'm not gonna twist your arm or anything. He said, yeah, I know, but that's your whole, and I don't wanna, and I'm, no, I'm just, it's just, I'm just, you're gonna give me feedback and I just want, no. He said, no, no. And I said, listen, could you, no! That's my study buddy story, thank you very much. <laughs> that was my success. I'll tell you what did happen though. I finally said, okay, okay. Do you have a friend that, that, that also doesn't care about this kind of stuff but might be a little more open? Because maybe you have a friend that I don't know yet because I'm exhausting my friendship possibilities here. <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy, he, he likes to talk about this stuff and he's always asking questions and he might, I said, could you talk to him for me? So he texted his friend, and his friend said yes, and we're gonna meet tomorrow. I found a study buddy. Yeah, sure, but here's the thing. I know what it's like to get shut down. And being a pastor doesn't help. Sometimes it just makes people more scared. <laughs> and I, I know what it's like, and it's shut down even, listen, I would've loved it if somebody said, yeah, I'd love to do this, because I got some questions for you, preacher man. I'd love to, I, I got some, I'm ready, to, and they're ready to argue, they're ready, I'd say, oh, good, all right, at least we're gonna have a conversation, this is great. What's really hard is when someone just doesn't care, right? They just don't care. Like I've said before, it's like one-sided Velcro. Just won't stick, just nothing. <laughs> and you just, hello, hello. That's the hardest thing to deal with, I get it. And so I just kept asking, finally found somebody who's a friend of a friend. Now, I say that to say, give it a try. I'm with you in this. It's hard and it's awkward, but if you don't find someone at first, ask around until you do find someone, and then you just wanna have five minutes each week to try it out. And if you can't do it in person, do it through email or Facebook, some kind of chat, see if you can have some back and forth and get feedback. You think you can do it? <laughs> oh. All right, let me share a scripture passage to close that'll hopefully make you feel guilty because I'm a pastor and I need to make you feel guilty. Here it goes. No, here's just an honest passage that I do wanna say provides an opportunity for us. It's James 1.22. Do not merely listen to the words and so deceive yourself, do what it says. Do not merely listen to the word. In other words, when we hear the gospel and we just listen, I find this fascinating, is that the more you just listen to something and don't act on it, it can become self-deceptive. It can become one of the ways we self-medicate because Listening to something, thinking about something, maybe talking about it with yourself or other people who are on the same page feels like you're actually doing it. Feels like I'm doing something. But you're not actually doing it until you actually do it. <laughs> but I know it feels like it and it can be kind of surrogate to the actual activity. I, I love uh, exercise magazines. <laughs> I actually do. <laughs> there was a time I used to buy them pretty regularly. You kind of flip through and say, yeah, if I did that, I could look like that, yeah. <laughs> oh, I could try that, and then my arms would be, oh, that's how I'd get a six pack, yep, that's what I would do. And then there'd be like supplements, and I just get, because supplements I get, I do that. I just get the supplements and start adding them to everything. And <laughs> I think if you just keep eating the same way and add supplements, it doesn't really do anything. 
but I wanted to be like them somehow. And then I'd like, oh yeah, then there's this fashion area. I was like, I get those kind of shoes. I could get this. And, I could, and everything to avoid exercise. But it felt like I'm addressing the situation. And, and I'd like to suggest that some of us may be caught in that weird stage of feeling like we're addressing the situation by talking about addressing the situation. And, and we can lull ourselves into a kind of uh, sleep or deception unless we just do what it says. And then when we actually act on it, treat it like it's true, we'll wake up and go, hey, this is not so bad. Hey, this is, I just wanna encourage you to consider that you might be in that weird loop and this could be an opportunity. Listen, if not this series, some of you are gonna say, well, you know what, this is something I'm gonna do later. When later? We'll be done this series, we will have moved on to other things, and then you're gonna feel all alone doing it, and you're gonna say, ah, oh, I wish I had done back then. Well, one day I'll do it. When, like in heaven? <laughs> if not this series, this is like the easiest it's ever gonna be for you. If not now, then when? If not you, then who? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask for your spirit's courage and conviction to lead us into a place of actually joyful obedience and a desire and an eagerness to share your good news with others. I pray you would help us be eager to learn and to learn actively, to learn in a way that helps us grow even by communicating this beautiful truth with others. And I look forward to the stories that will rise out of this in the weeks ahead. Stories of rejection, of failure, of just disconnect and awkwardness, but at least stories that are there because we wanna honor you and talk about you. Stories that might remind us more of Alexamenos than some, anyone else. Stories that don't seem victorious, but seem hard and painful but also those times when there is uh, an impact of truth that is made. I pray that we might honor you in all that we do in this area moving forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.